Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this webinar entitled Diagnostic Ultrasound of the Wrist and Hand, presented by Dr. Troy Henning. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. By the conclusion of this webinar, participants should be able to identify the six dorsal compartments of the wrist, recognize the median nerve and ulnar neurovascular structure, and list the sonographic findings associated with trigger finger and thumb. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIUM's policy to ensure that the contents and quality of this activity are balanced, independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of an educational activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Troy Henning and Dr. Darcy Belito de Luna have no disclosures. At the conclusion of this webinar, you will be able to access the CME test located on the AIUM website. Participants who complete the post-test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. For more information on accessing the CME test and claiming credit, please refer to the handout provided in the dashboard on the right side of your screen. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. During tonight's presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time he will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now I'm pleased to present Dr. Troy Henning. Oh. All right. Good evening or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, I would first like to thank Darcy for helping me with the webinar. I'd also like to thank Dr. Hall and Dr. Hoffman, as well as all of the organizations involved for inviting me to give this presentation. I have nothing to disclose. A preview for the talk tonight, we'll start going over the dorsal wrist and hand and then move on to the volar wrist and hand. Throughout the presentation, we'll discuss uh, potential ultrasound guided procedures for each area. <clears throat> Along the dorsal wrist, we'll talk about the uh, joint recesses and some of the hand joints, some of the ligaments you might want to look at, the dorsal compartment tendons, as well as briefly touch on the superficial radial nerve. As we know, the wrist is comprised of three uh, separate joints, the radiocarpal joint, the midcarpal joint, as well as the distal radial ulnar joint. Normally, these are non-communicating joints and only communicate if there is ligamentous or capsular disruption. Sonographically, we can see the um, dorsal aspect of the wrist. Normally, these recesses can be closed. Sometimes you may see a small uh, fusion. You may also see thickening of the capsule. And if you were to turn on Doppler, you may see increased Doppler signal signifying synovitis. The distal radial ulnar joint, pictured here in the bottom left, is best imaged with the transducer axial to the wrist or forearm. Here you see the ulna and the radius with the dorsal aspect of the uh, uh, recess here. On occasion, you may also see ganglion cysts along the dorsum of the wrist, as is the most common location for ganglion cyst. Usually these emanate from the scaphalunate um, interval where there will be a hole or tear in the ligament and capsular structure. <clears throat> Normally, uh, the scaphalunate ligament, which we'll touch on later, would have a nice compact fibular pattern without the fluid um, leaking out between the two bones. The, uh, the dorsal recesses can be easily accessed for intervention, such as injection or aspiration, Normally, I find it's easiest to approach it from a distal to proximal direction in plane with the transducer. The ne needle can be easily visualized coming down through the subcutaneous tissue into one of the target recesses. You would have to find a window between the overlying tendons, however. 
the distal radial ulnar joint can also be easily accessed from the dorsal aspect of the uh, wrist. Normally, we'd use a gel standoff. Here you see gel heaped up over top of the dorsum of the wrist. The needle is then brought in through the gel, through the back of the wrist, into the dorsal aspect of the distal radial ulnar joint, immediately deep to the extensor digitimedimi tendon. The hand joints, while they're more commonly assessed using radiographic imaging as depicted here, can be visualized on ultrasound where you may see joint diffusions, subluxation or displacement of the bones, as well as osteophytes. Ultrasound is more commonly used for interventions <clears throat> where we would target the joints for uh, injections. The CMC joint or the STT joint can be approached um, usually from a dorsal uh, to volar direction. The left image here is out of plane uh, injection relative to the joint, but in plane with the transducer. This uh, picture down here shows the location of the uh, transducer. The red arrow would signify the direction of the needle moving from a dorsal to volar direction. Again, using a gel standoff window, the needle is brought in through the gel, into the skin, and then down into the joint. Once the tip is located within the joint, the injection or aspiration can occur. The out-of-plane approach is uh, um, done with the transducer along the long axis of the thumb. The needle, again, is brought in from the dorsal aspect, short axis to the transducer in this case, where you'd look for an echogenic dot within the center of the joint. Finger joints, such as the MCP or IP joints, can be approached similarly. Again, more commonly assessed radiographically. <clears throat> Usually the injection, um, uh, uh, ultrasound-guided injection would be the more common reason to assess these joints. I find the out-of-plane approach, as discussed previously, is the most easiest way to uh, inject these joints. The transducer is placed along the long axis of the finger overlying the joint. The needle can then be brought in either from an ulnar to radial or radial to ulnar direction, depending on your preference. The needle would then be seen within the joint recess before the aspiration or injection would take place. Moving on to the dorsal ligaments, we commonly look at the scapholunate and lunotrochoidal ligaments. If we look at the radiographic image depicted here in the bottom center, you'll see the scaphoid and lunate are roughly just distal to the radius and along the same uh, axial plane. The transducer would then be placed over the dorsum of the radius axial relative to the forearm and then translated or slid distally until you see the scaphoid and lunate bones. Between them, you'd look for the compact fibular structure uh, delineating the scapholunate ligament. Going back to the radiographic image, you'll notice that the lunate and trichotrum here are slightly oblique relative to the forearm. Therefore, the transducer would need to be placed oblique as well to the forearm. And in order to adequately visualize this compact fibular structure connecting the dorsal aspect of the lunate and trichotrum. The thumb uh, is another common area where we would assess the ligament, specifically the ulnar collateral ligament of the thumb. As we know, this connects uh, on the ulnar side of the thumb at the level of the MCP joint connecting the metacarpal and the base of the proximal phalanx. Again, normally it would have a compact fibular structure. This ligament can be injured acutely, such as with skier's thumb, or chronically through um, a lot of tension over time, such as with gamekeeper's thumb. Typically, the ligament would be injured from its distal or insertion area along the base of the proximal phalanx, either involving solely the ligament or perhaps pulling off a chunk of bone with an avulsion fracture. The ligament may remain in place or, as depicted in this bottom left image, retract proximally and fold over on itself, creating the so-called Stenner lesion. A Stenner lesion is uh, would be a surgical uh, indication as the overlying adductor aponeurosis would fall down in the hole created by the void of the ulnar collateral ligament, not allowing it to flip back over on itself and scar in place. The ulnar collateral ligament can be easily visualized dynamically on ultrasound, either with deflecting the um, thumb with the transducer or using your opposing hand, looking for the integrity of the ligament you could compare side to side to see if there is excess of displacement on the symptomatic side versus the asymptomatic side. Additionally, to help delineate the um, 
location of the adductor aponeurosis, you can dynamically move the aponeurosis. Here we see the metacarpal and the proximal phalanx with the ulnar collateral ligament connecting the two bones. This relative hypochoic structure here is the adductor aponeurosis. The aponeurosis itself connects dorsally into the extensor pollicis longus tendon. We can th therefore use the extensor excursion of the extensor pollicis longus tendon by deflecting the IP joint of the thumb to move, sorry, to move the, um, pardon me, to move the um, aponeurosis back and forth, and making it more conspicuous or easier to see overlying the ulnar collateral ligament. Moving on to the dorsal compartments of the wrist, uh, you'll see that they are conveniently housed in a fiber osseous tunnel about the distal forearm. Starting on the most radial aspect, you have the first compartment, for, uh, which is composed of the adductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. The second compartment is the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. The third, which is separated from the second by a protrusion or bump along the dorsum of the radius called Lister's tubercle is the third compartment, which is extensor pollicis longus. The fourth would be more ulnar. It houses the extensor digitorum commonus as well as extensor indices proprius. This uh, diagram here is not necessarily that accurate. Normally, the extensor digitorum commonus is um, situated above the extensor indices proprius. The fifth compartment, or extensor digiti minimi or quinti, overlies the distal radial ulnar joint. And then lastly, the sixth compartment, or extensor carpi ulnaris, overlies the dorsal ulnar aspect of the ulna in a little fossa or fallopia on the side of the ulna. Clinically, the first and sixth compartments are most um, problematic. Here are some videos showing how to evaluate each of these compartments. Again, normally the transducer will be situated axial relative to the dorsum of the forearm and then and then uh, uh, placed over top of the uh, compartment that you're attempting to interrogate. Here we would move the transducer all the way to the owner or sorry to the radial side of the forearm to look at the first dorsal compartment. Again that houses the adductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis tendons. The right of the screen here is radial, left would be ulnar. This is the adductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis tendon adjacent to one another, overlying the radial styloid process here. Sometimes it's hard to differentiate the tendons from one another, and so you have to sometimes pull the transducer a little bit more distal than the radius to delineate the two uh, tendons. So here you see the larger tendon being the adductor pollicis longus and the, and the smaller tendon being the extensor pollicis brevis. The second compartment is composed again of the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. They insert into the base of the second and third metacarpal respectively. Here is the longus and this one is the brevis. So extensor carpi radialis longus and extensor carpi radialis brevis. The third compartment is the extensor pollicis longus. Again, this is just ulnar to the um, dorsal protuberance of the uh, radius called Lister's tubercle. So that's a nice uh, bony landmark that is always present. You can sometimes palpate it and you should always see it sonographically. You'll notice that the extensor pollicis longus will move from an ulnar to a relative radial direction as I move from the wrist or the dorsal radius into the hand. <clears throat> it's fairly small and sometimes hard to see as it crosses down into the hand. It would then go all the way down to the base of the distal phalanx of the thumb. Importantly here, you'll also note that it's crossing over the uh, second compartment tendons, which we will talk about um, in, in the near future. The fourth compartment is comprised of the extensor carpi, carpi um, extensor digitorum commus, and the extensor indices proprius. Again, the extensor digitorum commonus overlies the extensor indices proprius. As the video plays, you can see the extensor indices proprius and extensor digitorum commonus here as they separate from one another. Again, the EDC or extensor digitorum commonus overlies 
the proprius. The proprius along the dorsum of the hand would be more ulnar relative to its extensitorum um, counterpart. The fifth compartment overlies the dorsal aspect of the distal radial ulnar joint. It's depicted here. As the video plays, you'll see the extensor digitorum uh, or extensor digiti minimi move from a relative radial to a relative ulnar direction as it crosses the dorsum of the hand. Then lastly is the sixth compartment. Again, this is the extensor carpi ulnaris uh, tendon. It's immediately overlying the ulna depicted here. It will traverse across the wrist and then insert into the base of the fifth metacarpal. Here's the tendon in the little fossa on the ulna. Again, clinically, the first and sixth compartments are most clinically involved. Here is an example of Decravain's tenosynovitis. <clears throat> the first top left image shows the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis tendons. You'll note that the overlying retinaculum here is easily seen, which usually means that it's abnormal. Often it's only about a, um, a few a millimeter in thickness. Uh, often when it's abnormal, it will be quite thickened and readily apparent. Usually uh, it's thicker over the extensor pollicis brevis tendon. Also note in this image that the cortex of the radius has a slight ridge in it. This usually um, delineates the fact that there is a subcompartmentalization of the two tendons. So the retinaculum here is overlying the adductor pollicis longus and then extends down to the radius, creating a subcompartment of the extensor pollicis brevis tendon. This is usually, again, associated with this ridge in the radius. Normally, if it was not subcompartmentalized, the radius would be flat here. As you see in the bottom left image, the, the tendon sheaths are devoid of any Doppler signal. This is not usually an inflammatory problem as much as it is a stenosing uh, tenosynovitis issue. So the tendons are here are becoming entrapped by the overlying thickened retinaculum. This long axis image further accentuates the thickness of the extensor retinaculum overlying the tendons. This traps the tendons against the bone, creates irritation of the sheath, and then um, causes pain and sometimes triggering of the thumb. These uh, can be injected. Uh, classically, they're injected with corticosteroids. They can be um, injected either in plane with the transducer and the tendon coming from a distal to proximal direction or proximal to distal direction depending on your preference or out of plane relative to the um, tendons but in plane with the transducer. The goal essentially is to place the corticosteroid solution within the sheath of both tendons assuring that um, they are both treated accurately in case there is that subcompartmentalization um, occurring. The extensor carpi ulnaris can also be targeted easily. Typically, the forearm is pronated and the hand is flat on the table. Uh, using a gel standoff window, again, the needle is brought in plain with the transducer but short access to the tendon. The solution would then be injected into the tendon sheath. <clears throat> As people become more advanced with their skills uh, with ultrasound guided procedures and the um, technology advances, we're starting to broach into some surgical um, treatments for these disorders. So here is a, an example of a force, first dorsal compartment tendon release. The first top video here on the left shows an aesthetic being delivered um, around the extensor uh, retinaculum tendon here, filling the space around the, ten, uh, the retinaculum as well as the tendon sheets. Then using this no core needle, which is basically a hypodermic needle with an, a blade on the end of it, it is brought under direct sonographic guidance down into the retinaculum and used to cut the retinaculum, thereby um, releasing the compartment, as which would be done with um, a surgical approach. This top right uh, video here shows that the needle is being brought in directly or immediately overlying the compartment, ensuring proper placement in two planes while we're doing the procedure. The extensor carpi ulnaris, in addition to becoming entrapped or causing stenosing tenosynovitis, can also dislocate or sublux. This usually involves injury to the overlying retinaculum through a forced supination pronation maneuver, as which may be seen with um, activities such as tennis. The patient would complain of painful snapping along the ulnar aspect of the distal form or wrist area. 
it's best or most easily evaluated with ultrasound by having the patient place their elbow on the table or examining um, surface. The form would then be facing the um, ultrasonographer or um, person performing the study. The tendon would be uh, assessed in its short axis and then having the patient either actively or you passively flex and extending the wrist, you could look for excursion or movement of the uh, tendon out of the little groove or fovea here in the ulna in a volar direction. You should note that some subluxation or movement of the tendon out of the groove is normal. In fact, the study um, denotes that up to about 40% of the tendon may, in normal subjects or asymptomatic people, migrate out of the groove. So essentially, you want to see the majority, if not all, of the tendon come out of the groove to call it abnormal. Here's a video displaying how that would look. This is a normal exam. As the flexion extension is occurring, you'll see the move, movement of the tendon, but it's not moving out of the fovea of the, um, of the ulna. Moving a little bit more prox up along the forearm, there's a couple of other disorders referred to as intersection syndrome. These are more friction phenomena that occur between different tendon complexes as they overlap one another. The first one is, is in the distal forearm. It's where the first dorsal compartment would override the second dorsal compartment. <clears throat> this area can become painful in people that engage in activities such as rowing or weightlifting. This video might make it easier to understand what's happening here. Here you see the first dorsal compartment tendons overlying the second uh, compartment tendons. Again, the first is the adductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis coming over top of the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. This movement of the tendons, while normal, in some people can become painful and they would report painful cracking or crepitus type sensation. Moving further down into the hand, as we saw earlier, the third compartment will move over top of the second. So again, the third compartment is extensor pollicis longus, and it's going to migrate from ulna to radial over top of the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. Again, another area of potential um, friction and uh, painful crepitus that may occur. Treatment for these could include ultrasound-guided injection. Typically, the corticosteroid solution would be placed between the involved tendon complexes. Mostly, we would come in from a radial aspect, moving ulnarly with the needle in plane with the transducer. The solution would be placed between the two tendon compartments. Moving further down along the dorsum of the finger, you can have injuries to the extensor tendon complex. At the DIP joint, you can have injury to the end of the tendon where it inserts into the base of the distal phalanx, uh, such as may be seen with a ball striking the end of the finger, creating a mallet injury. It can involve injury to a tendon alone or a piece of bone creating an avulsion fracture. This would lead to inability to fully extend the DIP joint. If the extensor tendon itself is injured along its central tendon portion here, then they may have the inability to fully extend at the PIP joint. If injury occurs to the dorsal hood, which is a retinacular structure that essentially envelops the MCP joint, um, where the extensor tendon as, is uh, maintained in place, and then some of the intrinsic muscles and tendons are connecting into, if that structure is injured, it will allow these intrinsic muscles and tendons to migrate volar relative to the axis of the joint, and you'll get a boutonniere deformity, which is essentially hyperextension of the MCP joint, hyperflexion of the PIP joint, and hyperextension of the DIP joint. <clears throat> Here is uh, a little bit more information on our dorsal hood injury. As you can see from this diagram on the left, this is the essential construct of this region. Dorsal would be on the top of the image, volar would be on the bottom. The ET stands for the extensor tendon, CT is connective tissue. This dark line here is the extensor hood. It has an ulnar sagittal band and a radial sagittal band. And as you see, it pretty much goes all the way down around to the volar side, connecting into the palmar plate on the volar side of the joint. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> Typically, the dorsal hood would be injured along this radial sagittal band, such as may be seen, <clears throat> excuse me, with boxer's injury, where the um, flexed fist is struck against an object, thereby rupturing this radial sagittal band. This could then lead to instability ex of the extensor tendon, which would then migrate in an ulnar direction. So as the patient would flex their fingers, you would see the extensor tendon snap or migrate in an ulnar direction over the dorsum of the MCP joint, and this is often a painful process. <clears throat> Here's the sonographic image of that area. Again, you have the extensor tendon, the connective tissue here, and then the underlying metacarpal. This relative hypocoic structure here is the ulnar sagittal band. Over here is the radial sagittal band. You'd be looking for injury along this region with uh, migration of the extensor tendon in an ulnar direction if this was injured. That this can be assessed dynamically. Typically, you need to use a large amount of standoff gel here to see these structures as they are quite superficial, and some compression of the transducer may prevent subluxation of the tendon. So you want to use very light transducer pressure. Here, the tendon is being isometrically um, <clears throat> contracted, and it's tensioning the sagittal bands on either side, showing that, that they are intact. If they were not intact, then the tendon would migrate in an ulnar direction. <clears throat> Moving on to the superficial radial nerve, this can be injured as it becomes more superficial. As we know, it's a branch off the radial nerve at the level of the elbow. It then tracks underneath the brachioradialis muscle. Along the dorsum distal aspect of the forearm, it comes out between the brachioradialis tendon um, depicted here, as well as the extensor carpi radialis longus tendon here. <clears throat> we'll see in a video in a little bit this nerve bundle here will come up through those two tendons. This is a potential entrapment site for the nerve and can cause painful um, neuropathic pain along the dorsum of the thumb and hand. As it becomes more superficial, it's also then prone to compression from external ligatures such as handcuffs or tight wristbands, etc., leading to chiralgia parasitica. <clears throat> this high resolution video shows the nerve as migrating out into a more superficial location from underneath the brach brachioradialis tendon. Here you see multiple fascicles of the superficial radial nerve. I'll let it play a few times so that you can see it. <clears throat> so here's the brachioradialis tendon, extensor carpi radialis, uh, longus tendon over here. As the nerve uh, becomes more superficial, it's then going to migrate over the first dorsal compartment here, which is again the adductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis tendons. Along the dorsum of the hand, we also have the potential for accessory muscles. Usually this would present with an adolescent coming in with this non-painful enlarging, gradually enlarging mass, uh, creating, uh, creating some uh, concern. Uh, the most common would be the extensor digitorum brevis manus, which occurs in about 2 to 3% of the population. As you can see from the diagram uh, at the top right, <clears throat> it often either comes off the radius or a combination of the radius and ulna, usually inserting along the extensor uh, digitorum communis uh, along the index finger. It may have a single or uh, have two muscle bellies and two separate tendons. If it is present, you should look at the other side because it can be present bilaterally in about a third to half. You would know that this is muscle by looking at the mass with ultrasound, where you would see in the long axis a normal pinnate pattern, and the short axis you see the normal starry night appearance. Additionally, dynamically, you would see the muscle contracting and getting enlarged or smaller, uh, depending on which way the contraction is occurring. Moving on to the volar wrist, we'll look at the uh, carpal tunnel, Guillain's canal, the wrist and finger flexors, uh, talk about wrist ganglions, move on down to the fingers and talk about pulleys. There'll be a, uh, a section on um, differentiating different types of tenosynovitis uh, injuries, flexor tendon injuries, and then again wrapping up with some anomalous muscles and potential tumors around the hand. As we know, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome is a very common problem in the population. The carpal tunnel is composed of a bony base with an overlying retinacular structure, the transverse carpal ligament. Within the tunnel, 
you have nine tendons in the nerve, the median nerve. The nine tendons are the four tendons of the FDS, four tendons of the FDP, and the flexor pollicis longus tendon. The entrance uh, to the uh, carpal tunnel is the uh, tubercle of the scaphoid and the pisiform. So here's a sonographic image. The purple line here denotes the transverse carpal ligament. Here is the median nerve here in the center. The distal extent of the tunnel is the tubercle of the trapezium and the hook of the hamate. The line, dotted green line here is the uh, rough location of the distal transverse carpal ligament. The distal aspect of the ligament is much thicker than it is volarly. Typically with ultrasound, we're asked to look at, at the carpal tunnel to see if someone has carpal tunnel syndrome. There's a variety of studies um, assessing this. Here are some of the common numbers that you know, uh, would be uh, used when assessing for carpal tunnel syndrome. Most often we're looking at the cross-sectional area of the median nerve uh, within the carpal tunnel as well as different places along the forearm. In general, if the cross-sectional area of the median nerve within the carpal is greater than nine square millimeters, they likely have carpal tunnel syndrome or median neuropathy at the wrist. Another way of looking at this is comparing the cross-sectional area of the median nerve at the proximal one-third of the pronator quadratus to the maximal area of thickness within the carpal tunnel. If that difference is greater than two square millimeters, that would also suggest the presence of median neuropathy at the wrist. Some would use ultrasound as a screening tool to determine whether or not an EMG would be necessary. Again, if the cross-sectional area of the median nerve within the carpal tunnel is less than nine, someone suggested that you do not need an EMG. It, if, it's, if it is grossly enlarged at 17 square millimeters, then again, someone suggests that you do not need an EMG as it is grossly apparent that they have median neuropathy at the wrist. This study at the bottom here <clears throat> has compared sonographic findings to that of electrodiagnostic findings, allowing us to give some degree of severity or involvement. Using the cross-sectional area of, of the median nerve at maximal enlargement within the carpal tunnel, if it's less than 10, they would say it was normal. If it was 10 to 12, they would categorize it as mild. 13 to 15, moderate. Greater than 15 would be categorized as severe. In addition to size, you should also look at the echo texture. So if there is increased hypoexigenicity or enlargement of the fascicles, that would also suggest injury. If there is an indentation of the nerve um, by the overlying thickening of the transverse carpal ligament as depicted here, that would be considered a notch sign. The notch being compression of the nerve with enlargement of the nerve proximal and distal to the transverse carpal ligament. These two images here on the left show how you would measure or do the cross-sectional area um, comparison between the proximal third of the pronator quadratus to that of the maximal enlargement of the nerve within the um, carpal tunnel. Again, if that is greater than two square millimeters, it would suggest the presence of carpal tunnel syndrome. Of course, there's always going to be variations in anatomy, and so you may see patients with a bifid median nerve. So here is one limb of the median nerve, and here is the second. Faintly here, you can see the presence of a persistent median artery, which is a branch off the ulnar artery uh, at the level of the elbow. This video will make the appearance of the bifid median nerve more apparent. If the patient does have a bifid median nerve, you need to separately measure the cross-sectional area of both, add them together, and that would give you the total cross-sectional area. Carpal tunnel, uh, uh, ultrasound-guided carpal tunnel injections can be performed. This study suggests a uh, way to do it. Typically, the transducer would be held axial relative to the wrist. The needle would be brought in from an ulnar to radial direction in plane with the transducer. It would come in over top of the ulnar neurovascular structures and then place either deep or superficial or some combination relative to the nerve where the injectate could be um, placed. Again, as um, technology advances and operators become more skilled, uh, we're verging on doing surgical procedures with ultrasound guidance. There's been over 600 uh, peer-reviewed cases in the literature 
with no report of injuries, no need to convert to a surgical release, with similar outcomes as would be reported with open and endoscopic release. The procedure has been performed with a variety of tools, either hook knives borrowed from surgery or devices created um, specifically for the procedure. Here's an example of uh, how a procedure may be performed. This device is brought in uh, under sonographic guidance into the carpal tunnel. It's then placed along or deep to the transverse carpal ligament in an area called the transverse safe zone, which is an area between the median nerve and the hook of the hamate. Here you see the device in between those two structures. This particular device has an extra added safety feature built into it where saline balloons would be inflated as depicted here in this top uh, right image. The balloons further displace the median nerve away from the center of the device where the knife is located, increasing its margin of safety. This top uh, right image, uh, the bottom of that image, shows the actual blade coming up through the transverse carpal ligament, ligament creating the um, uh, incision in the ligament. The patient would be left with a small incision along the distal forearm. Here are a couple of videos demonstrating that as well. Here we see the balloons being inflated, further displacing the median nerve away from the center of the device, again, where the knife is located, increasing its margin of safety. Here we see the knife being brought up through the transverse car carpal ligament, dividing it, creating the release. And then lastly, we can use the device to then push up through the um, um, cut in the ligament, um, ensuring that the ligament has be been completely released. Importantly, when doing these more advanced procedures, we need to ensure that we know all the structures that we would want to avoid, specifically the thenar motor branch. As we know, this is the motor branch that comes off typically from the radial aspect of the median nerve and then would come back from a distal to proximal direction and enter into the um, um, thenar muscles. This video shows the <coughs> Uh, thenar motor branch coming off the median nerve. Here it's a hypochoic structure, very small, but coming off from a dorsal location, I'm sorry, a volar location off the radial limb of the median nerve, and then moving more uh, volarly, kind of overlapping the distal end of the transverse carpal ligament, entering the muscle. Again, um, you're always going to run into surprises. So there are some variations in the thenar motor branch. Sometimes they'll come off from the ulnar side, which may make releasing it ultrasonographically more difficult or perhaps inappropriate. This uh, video shows a thenar motor branch, which is coming off proximal to the carpal tunnel. So here's the median nerve. Again, this is a high resolution ultrasound image. The thenar motor branch is coming off um, proximal to the carpal tunnel, then traverses through the transverse carpal ligament. Doing an ultrasound guided release in this case would likely um, potentially lead to injury to this nerve and therefore be inappropriate. Here, this video shows the nerve coming up through the transverse carpal ligament. Moving on to the ulnar and neurovascular structures, or they are live within the Guillain's canal in the wrist. That canal is formed uh, by the pisiform proximally and the hook of the hamate distally. The roof is formed by the palmar carpal ligament. The floor is the extension of the transverse carpal ligament. The ulnar artery lies radial with the um, ulnar nerve um, ulnar to that. At the entrance, it's a singular nerve or a mixed nerve where there's both motor and sensory fibers. Overlying the hook of the hamate, that mixed nerve splits into a superficial sensory and a deep motor branch. The nerve here can be subject to compression from ganglion cysts off the piezotrochial joint aneurysms of the artery, or sometimes in those people that have an accessory abductor digiti minimi. Moving on to the finger flexor uh, uh, and wrist flexor tendons. Again, the carpal tunnel houses um, nine tendons, four FDS and four FDP, with the flexor pollicis longus being most adjacent or uh, along uh, the scaphoid. The flexor carpi radialis overlies the scaphoid. The flexor carpi ulnaris will insert into the pisiform. 
this video shows how you could assess those tendons <coughs> of the finger flexors <coughs> excuse me, dynamically by having the patient move their fingers, allowing you to see them more clearly. This image is a long axis view of the flexor carpi radialis. This is a very challenging tendon to see um, all the way down distally, as it lives in its own fiber osseous tunnel uh, created by the tubercle of the trapezium, somewhat overlapping the tendon. The, the tendon itself is inserting here into the base of the second metacarpal. The bottom right image shows the flexor carpi ulnaris coming down into the pisiform. It, the pisiform, as we know, is a sesamoid bone. The tendon then extends down to the hook hook of the hamate forming the piezohamate ligament. There's another extension that goes from the piezoform down to the base of the fifth metacarpal forming the piezometacarpal ligament. <clears throat> Along the volar wrist you may also see ganglion cysts. These usually arise from the radiocarpal joint on the radial aspect of the wrist and are often either adjacent or wrapping around the radial artery making them much more difficult or potentially um, inappropriate to aspirate. When I see these and they're wrapped around the radial artery, I'm usually referring them to surgery for direct decompression. Moving down to the fingers, the flexor tendons, uh, uh, the FDS and uh, FDP, are held in place or adjacent to the underlying bone through retinacular structures. These are um, depicted here in this diagram. The odd ones overlie the joints, the even ones overlie the middle uh, aspect of the proximal and mid phalanx, respectively. The most commonly involved ones clinically would be the A1 pulley, which would be responsible for trigger finger or thumb. The A2 through A4 pulleys can be injured traumatically through forced finger flexion, such as may be seen with rock climbing, um, where the retinaculums would tear and then lead to um, impaired function of the fingers as a result. <clears throat> Again, pulley ruptures uh, would allow the tendons to migrate off the bone. Typically, the retinaculum holds the tendons down against the bone tightly. This allows for a greater degree of excursion of the um, joints where the tendons are acting. If the tendons are allowed to bowstring off, then the patient will not have as much of a degree of flexion at the respective joint, thereby impairing their function. This diagram shows a rupture of the A2 pulley in this case, allowing the tendons to bowstring off the um, underlying phalanx. This sonographic image shows um, uh, that process where the tendon is elevated off the meta I'm sorry, the um, phalanx here, and there is an effusion either within the tendon sheath or um, between the tendon and the underlying bone. These videos show normal uh, tendon excursion here on the left. So normally the tendons would be freely mobile underneath the retinacular structures. If they were thickened or injured, they may impair the sliding or gliding of these tendons. To assess the integrity of the tendons, a two through A4, you may also want to load the tendon isometrically, trying to push the tendon off the bone. Here you see a normal uh, amount of motion occurring between the tendon and the bone. Here's an example of an A2 injury. The uh, left Im image here is shows both the right normal side and left involved side. As you see on the right side, the tendon's held immediately adjacent to the bone, whereas on the injured side, it's held up off the bone through this effusion. This video here shows that the tendon is um, moving away from the underlying bone, again, signifying injury to the overlying pulley. In this case, it's the A2 pulley. Moving back to the A1 pulley at tr uh, for the finger and thumb, uh, this can cause triggering or stenosis of that um, compartment or the um, region. It would trap the tendon uh, between the overlying thickened retinaculum and the underlying joint. This causes pain and inability to either flex the thumb or can cause trapping of the finger in a flexed position. Normally, this is a clinical evaluation. However, sonographically, there are some signs of this. 
one being thickening of the retinaculum, similar to, as I mentioned before, with Dequer veins, the retinaculum will be much thicker, squishing the tendon against the underlying joint or bone. Additionally, it would cause deflection of the tendon, where you would get anisotropy of the tendon or the dark tendon sign. Additionally, because of the thickened retinaculum, you're going to get a little bit more roundness to it, and that's going to cause a little refractile shadowing at the edge of the pulley, again, contributing to some of that dark tendon sign. And then lastly, dynamically, as I showed previously, the tendon should move uh, freely underneath the pulley. If this tendon is being squished between the pulley and the, retina, or the underlying bone, then that tendon excursion would be impaired. Here's another high-resolution image of uh, a normal pulley. Um, typically, they're very hard to see, but with this high-resolution transducer, you can easily make out the dimensions of the retina, uh, retinaculum overlying the tendons here. Again, here is the normal uh, retinaculum or A1 pulley. It's very hard to see. It's a hypochoic, very thin structure. When it's abnormal, it would be many more times thick and very easily seen. T trigger finger can be treated with splinting or injections or release. Injections can be done uh, with ultrasound guidance, either in plane or out of plane relative to the transducer or tendons. There's evidence to show that being relatively close to the pulley uh, would make it more effective as opposed to being deep to the tendons. Again, as we advance with our skill and knowledge and um, higher uh, end machines, we're able to do more things. So here's some pictures of the injection being performed, a little video here showing um, proper needle placement and then injection of the solution around it. Here's an um, example of trigger thumb. So the top left image shows the normal left and an abnormal right side, where the, the right retinaculum is much thicker than it is on the normal side and then we're injecting it here in the bottom right image. <coughs> Sorry. Moving on to flexor tendon injuries. Um, there are essentially five types. It depends on the degree of proximal retraction of the tendon as well as whether or not there is bony involvement, but these could be uh, easily depicted on um, ultrasound evaluation. Moving on to the different types of tenosynovitis, uh, this is more of a uh, for your information kind of grouping of slides. Essentially, tenosynovitis can be broken up into inflammatory causes and what I would consider non-inflammatory causes or stenosing issues. So the Tenosynovitis to me is typically a, uh, an inflammatory reaction that involves the lining of the synovial sheath and or tendon. Causes could include systemic inflammatory diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, amyloidosis, or gout, or perhaps infections. The stenosing ones are the ones we've covered already, including trigger finger, decor veins, intersection syndrome, ECU um, entrapment, or um, injury to the FCR. Um, these are related to entrapment of the tendon in the fiber osseous um, tendon, and that leads to degeneration of the tendon. <clears throat> Proliferative tenosynovitis, or one of the inflammatory causes, had traditionally been most uh, commonly involved with rheumatoid arthritis. However, with the advent of the disease modifying agents, I, I don't see this as much but you may see it in patients that either cannot or choose not to use that medication. <clears throat> the inflammation starts in the adjacent tendon or joints and then um, propagates into the sheath. Uh, because of the amount of swelling that can occur, um, it can lead to you know, mobile kind of fluctuation of the fluid. So you might see some fluctuating movement as they move their fingers. It typically will involve the four through the six compartments. On the flexor side, it can cause um, uh, compression of the median nerve, so giving the patient carpal tunnel symptoms, or it can cause entrapment of the tendons, such as would be seen with trigger finger. Here's a sonographic image along with its MRI correlative. On the sonographic image, you see thickening and proliferation of the synovial tissue of the tendon sheath. The MRI clearly shows increased fluid uh, signal in all of the tendon sheaths and joints of this uh, image. <clears throat> 
the fluid can cause um, com direct compression of the uh, tendon and the tennis sheath, as well as the um, arterial supply to the tendon, which can then lead to ischemia and rupture. As we know, the uh, inflammatory um, disease process involves the joint as well, and it can lead to ligamentous or capsular injury, which then leads to malpositioning of bones, which then can lead to attritional tears of the tendons. More commonly, you'll see crystalline tendinopathy. So this is gout, pseudogout, or uh, calcific tendinitis. <clears throat> Again, gout is uh, monosodium urate crystals uh, because of an overproduction or under secretion of the, uh, sorry, excretion of the uh, um, urate crystal. It leads to an acutely painful, swollen, potentially red um, uh, joint or region. <clears throat> if uh, it's a clinical diagnosis confirmed with um, uh, fluid sample or tissue sample, where you would see the negatively birefringent needle shaped crystals, typically treated with NSAIDs, colchicine, and steroid injection. Prevention is um, preferred treatment uh, uh, as well uh, using medication as well as dietary changes. Pseudogout is related to calcium pyrophosphate, pyrophosphate dihydrate deposition, usually within the fibro or articular cartilage. Positively birefringent rhomboid, rhomboid crystals would be seen. Radiographically, you would see these as fluff, fluffy calcifications within the fiber cartilage or articular cartilage. It's treated similar as would be for um, arthritis, or arthritis if it's the joint. It could also lead to thickening of the flexor tendons in the carpal tunnel, leading to um, compression of the median nerve and carpal tunnel syndrome. Calcific tendonitis in the wrist typically involves the flexor carpi ulnaris tendon, more commonly in middle-aged women. It's the deposition of calcium hydroxide appetite within the tendon. They would present with an acutely painful swollen uh, ulnar side of the volar wrist. You may see it radiographically as well as on ultrasound. Deposition diseases uh, are also um, responsible for causing enlargement of the soft tissue and pain and swelling uh, of the tendons and tissue about the wrist. Um, amyloidosis, which would be seen in renal dialysis patients or patients with multiple myelosis, or sorry, multiple myeloma, where you get deposition of this beta-2 microglobulin within the soft tissue. Again, it would cause swelling of the soft tissue, thereby potentially leading to carpal tunnel syndrome or trigger finger. Ochronosis is an inability to metabolize tryptophan, again, causing deposition of this homogenistic acid within the soft tissue and leading to a space-occupying lesion. Septic tenosynovitis uh, typically would present to the emergency room uh, as it would be quite painful. It's uh, typically involving one of the tenon sheaths, which tend to be um, closed spaces, would involve some uh, uh, of normal skin flora such as staph aureus or strep or pastorella from an animal bite. The patients would be um, exquisitely uh, tender to palpation. They would have a lot of pain with passive or active motion. You would see gross swelling of the involved region as well. Again, on the similar to the dorsal side, on the volar side, you'll have some accessory muscles, most commonly be uh, a presence of a digastric belly of the FDS, so two muscle bellies, with a more distal one encroaching into the carpal tunnel, which could then lead to extra stuff crammed into the carpal tunnel, compressing the median nerve and giving the patient carpal tunnel symptoms. As we mentioned before, you can have an accessory abductor digitum minimi, which would overlie Guillain's canal, potentially compressing the ulnar nerve and giving you an ulnar neuropathy. Fortunately, tumors about the hand are usually benign. We'll discuss three of them. Giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath is essentially pigmented villonodular synovitis. It involves the flexor tendons where you'll see this hypochoic to uh, anechoic um, swelling around the tendon. It may have increased Doppler signal and may cause uh, inuberation of the adjacent bone. A glomus tumor is an avascular morph, uh, malformation along or deep to the nail bed, as well as along the volar tip of the finger. It would be exquisitely painful, and an ultrasound, you'd see a lot of chaotic blood flow. And then lastly, you can have lipomas. Uh, they can be 
either within the um, subcutaneous tissue or within the muscles, most commonly the phenar muscle. If it was in the subcutaneous tissue, it would be isochoic to the adjacent fat. If it was within the muscle, it would be hyperechoic relative to the adjacent muscle. So that's the conclusion of my presentation tonight. Um, Darcy, is there time for uh, questions? Yes, and I I did send you a few. Let me know if you can see them. Okay. Can you, uh, sorry, can you remind yeah. me again where I would? That's fine. If you um, click that orange arrow, you should uh -huh. be able to see your navigation bar Question. and there's one for questions. And then you can open it up. We have at okay. least three. So the first question is, do I use sterile gel for the procedures? I do, as I um, bring the needle uh, through uh, the gel on occasion. Even if I'm not doing it, I still use sterile gel. So it comes, we buy it in a kit. It comes with a, a cover as well as a sterile gel. And then I don't have to worry about it. The second question is, how do you load or stress a pulley of the finger? Um, so it, it's usually an isometric contraction of the involved digit. So the transducer would be um, overlying the, the pulley that I'm trying to assess. And then I would have, using my opposite finger, opposite hand, or perhaps even the transducer, um, resist the flexion of the patient's finger. And then that would tension the tendon and allow uh, either for visualization of normal excursion or stressing of the pulley and uh, you'd be looking to see if it would migrate away from the underlying bone. Um, the next question is, what is the plan of examination of compartment one? Uh, so uh, if I understand your question correctly, um, the, the compartment one is housing the abductor pollis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. Typically, I would find my uh, listers tubercle and then translate the transducer still in the axial plane relative to the form, but migrate in a radial direction until I'm overlying the first compartment. And then I would migrate the transducer proximally and distally along that compartment. Um, I always look at these in their short axis or cross section first. If I see an abnormality, then I'll interrogate it in its long axis as well. Uh, next question is, do I have images for flexor tenus synovitis? Um, uh, the, all, all the images that I have, I, I have shown in the um, presentation. Um, I could um, keep this uh, as a reminder, and if I find some, I can send them along to you. Last one is recap of the tumors, please. Uh, sounds like maybe I went through that too quickly. So there's um, three types of masses that you may see in the hand. First one being a giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath. That is also known as pigmented villonodular synovitis of the tendon sheath. It's usually on the flexor side, uh, typically in the finger region, and you would see um, uh, fullness of the sheath uh, would be anechoic to hypochoic. There may be increased Doppler signal. And then um, usually it's a chronic indolent uh, process until it becomes uh, painful and enlarged and it's brought to the patient's attention. And so therefore it's compressing on the adjacent bone and, and can cause um, irregularity of the bone. The next one would be um, uh, uh, a lipoma, and that is either in within the subcutaneous tissue or within the muscle. Um, if it's within the subcutaneous tissue, it would be isoechoic or similar appearance to the adjacent fat. Um, if it's within the muscle, it would be hyperechoic relative to the muscle um, itself. And then um, uh, the last one is the uh, glomus tumor, which is an avascular malformation that's found at the tip of the finger. They would present with a painful swollen fingertip. Um, uh, the AVM is either found underneath the nail in the nail bed or along the volar tip of the finger. So uh, are there, is, that the, is that all the questions? Um, do you have time for a few more? 
Sure. Okay, then I'll, um, let's get you another one. So the, um, the to which direction um, do you ultrasound when evaluating for a possible glomus tumor? Um, I showed um, mostly one projection for um, evaluating structures as um, some structures are more amenable to interrogating or looking at them in their short axis, some are more easily seen in their long axis. So you would look at it in, in both axes. Um, to me, the, the nail bed would be most easily uh, seen and or make most sense to me if it was um, initially interrogated in its long axis. I would then, if saw an abnormality, would also image it in its short axis or cross section. And I've sent you just a few more, but you let me know. Yeah, so the, the next one has to do how do you differentiate um, uh, PVNS versus tenosynovitis. Um, it, it's really, it's it's a um, combination of history as well as um, physical exam and then imaging findings. And so um, uh, uh, tenosynovitis, a true inflammatory um, disease process, outside of there being an infection, which may be isolated to a singular tendon sheath. The other ones like rheumatoid arthritis um, or other systemic inflammatory um, disease processes, it should be more systemic. So it should be more than one tendon sheath involved. Um, the cortical irregularities seen with the PVNS um, denote the length of time it's been present. Um, and so typically with a inflammatory tenosynovitis, the patient probably isn't going to wait long enough to allow the um, bone to be involved um, from the, um, from the uh, tenosynovial involvement. Um, next question, and what is, uh, what's your ultrasound injection technique for scapho, lunate, OA, uh, transducer plane, needle size gauge, et cetera? So um, <clears throat> that was one of my first couple slides there where I was talking about the dorsal recess. Um, typically, I would approach the um, either the uh, radiocarpal joint or the midcarpal joint um, in plane with the transducer and along the long axis of the hand. So I'd, uh, I would align the transducer with my target joint, traditionally directly underneath the transducer, and then I would find a window uh, where I could put the needle in um, in that region without going through a tendon, um, preferably, and then down into the into the whichever recess I'm targeting. It, the, the gauge of the needle depends on what I'm trying to achieve. So if I'm just doing an injection of cortisone or, or something else, I would traditionally use a 27 gauge inch and a quarter needle. If I'm going to aspirate it, then of course I would anesthetize first, and then I would use an 18 gauge uh, inch and a half needle. And then we have one last uh, one. last one. Do you see a difference in outcomes for carpal tunnel intervention between standard surgery versus ultrasound guided surgery? Um, right. So there's a uh, uh, number of studies uh, looking at outcome measures. Uh, traditionally, um, the Boston Carpal Tunnel Questionnaire as well as the Quick Dash surveys have been used um, it, when looking at the ultrasound guided release procedures as that is those are typically the same outcome measures that would be used in either the open or endoscopic release and as far as I know I understand from the review of the literature um, and having done uh, a study on my, myself the outcomes are comparable um, the outcomes uh, also show that the recovery from the procedure is faster um, and patients seem to uh, prefer it uh, over the open or endoscopic release when when they've had you know both procedures performed. So let's say they had open or endoscopic on the right, they underwent carpal tunnel on the left, they have equally good outcomes and are um, more pleased with the, their whole process with the ultrasound guided release. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Henning.
Uh, and on behalf of the AIUM and the AMSSM, our thanks to all of you who participated in tonight's webinar. Please complete the activity evaluation and remember to visit the CME Center on our website for the post-test. We hope you enjoyed this presentation and will join us again for future webinars. Good night, everyone.